and welcome to the 29th meeting in 2018 of the Health and Sport Committee. Can I ask everyone in the room please to ensure uh, that mobile phones are off or switched to silent uh, and while it's, uh, uh, you're very welcome to use social media, to use devices for social media purposes, please do not uh, film or record proceedings as that will be done uh, for us by Parliament. Uh, the first item of business is consideration of evidence heard today in informal sessions on the Human Tissue uh, Authorisation Scotland Bill, and I'm delighted that a number of those who gave that informal evidence are in the public gallery uh, this morning. Uh, the committee heard evidence from three groups, uh, from people who have received donated organs, from family members who have authorised the donation of organs, and from people currently on the organ uh, donor waiting list. And uh, uh, although we will move shortly to take formal evidence, I would ask colleagues to feedback, please, uh, on those informal uh, evidence sessions. Can I start with Emma Harper? Thank you, convener. Um, we had an interesting small session, Brian Whittle and I, and uh, some of the themes that came out of it was that uh, education is really critical to engage families and and potential donors to actually record their wishes on the organ donation register. The issues around presumed consent is that uh, generally was supportive, but uh, I think the, the critical goal would be that we would uh, engage people as early as possible or as uh, at certain ways to actually get their wishes expressed. We did have some discussion about economic arguments a little bit about uh, the uh, the cost benefits of organ donation uh, versus dialysis costs which was an interesting side uh, side topic uh, which is uh, included and um, one of the questions about how important is it for you to know that an organ is donated as a gift uh, as opposed to presumed consent was the the feeling was uh, an organ is is it's an amazing thing to 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 be given. So, um, and the donor information is not often as uh, clearly it sought. So, but any organ that was available is welcome. Thank you very much, Brian. The, 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 for me, the overwhelming message was that the, the, around the, the public understanding of org organ donation is very poor. What's What's involved in it, what it means uh, in terms of you know, you know, uh, the lifespan of, of an organ when it's donated, and that, you know, that especially if it's a young person, the likelihood is they'll need two, maybe even three uh, organs throughout their lifetime. Um, so I think I think that was a, a big message for me. So again, so the education, as, as Emma said, but the one thing that that that, um, that, that jumped out, I wasn't quite expecting. Uh, that was one of my uh, questions is around. Um, if you're going to have presumed consent, where the tension lies between co presumed consent and also having an opt-in at the same time, which was uh, quite an interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, Miles Briggs. Um, thank you, convener. Um, again, I won't uh, repeat some of the points um, Emma's raised, which um, our group also had. Just to put on record our thanks to um, the individuals and the families who, who came along to speak to us today. There were some specific points which I picked up um, particularly around conversations, which hopefully the bill can take forward with families and across Scotland, that it's important that we do try to um, have these conversations with our loved ones and, and actually have the conversations and express our wishes ourselves. And there was key points around a future public information campaign um, to be held around that. As Emma had mentioned, um, keeping two key principles, one of a gift of life and also a family decision-making also being included um, was highlighted. Um, there was a few points which I thought were worth uh, developing. One was around advanced directive um, of someone to actually make um, that view known. Um, and that was something I thought um, we haven't really looked at in as much detail as we should. Um, also, in terms of that point, um, you know, complex uh, relationships and changing families um, across Scotland where it's maybe not necessarily clear in the future who a next of kin uh, is and I think that's something we need to look at and and just finally um, I thought it was worth also putting on record um, 
the experience of the key professionals and the organ donor nurse teams um, was absolutely excellent and everyone who we spoke to today outlined um, how good they had been and actually the support they provided. Thank you and, and the group you were talking to were families who had authorised uh, uh, the donation of organs. Were there other members in that group? Uh, Keith? It was really interesting and thank you to those that came along uh, <laughs> and in a, quite a difficult session I think really uh, helpful. Some of the issues it raised for me were the possibility for families themselves to be divided um, on the question if they are put in that position and where lies the um, interest of the donor in that circumstance. The burden of the extra 24 hours I think was mentioned by a number of people which has to happen um, and also the burden as well and uh, one woman in particular about how put into that situation being the best way to describe it is in a bit of a dwam and just thinking you haven't to deal with so much at that time is it fair to put people into that situation at the time um, and I think the other the other aspect was the the idea of a gift um, is it a gift if the state's got a preemptive right um, to those organs uh, is it a gift if it's given by somebody other than the person whose organs they belong to um, so some really uh, interesting questions. It was obviously difficult for the families, but the point about the gift, I would say, the last thing is that um, the way that it's currently done in terms of the medal and the recognition and the information passed to the donors' families about where organs have gone was really appreciated. And whatever does happen in the course of this bill, that, that shouldn't be lost. Much. Sandra White. I think it's been very well covered by Miles and Keith. The issues, particularly about the gift, uh, that was one that came across strongly. One of the areas which uh, I sort of explored was obviously the pre death procedures as well and the length, you know the 24 36 hours in between was quite a harrowing time for uh, you know the families uh, of the people who had deceased uh, whilst they were brain dead I didn't realize either so in some aspects of it they were actually still breathing uh, and I thought it was very moving the evidence that that, that was given and, and uh, I must thank the, the families uh, very very much I think that's something that we need to explore people are not educated enough on that particular one about how you have to preserve the organs and the differences there so for me that was one that stood out but Keith and, and Miles have raised some really good points as well Thank, thank you very much. And the third group was uh, people who had received uh, donations of organs, uh, and I was uh, privileged enough to be part of that discussion. It was a very, again, a very moving discussion, and one which really put uh, a clear focus on the lived experience of patients who have waited sometimes a long time, sometimes a short time, but in intensive care for uh, a, an organ donation, and the way in which different individuals respond to those circumstances differently and there's no right uh, way to deal with that um, uh, but clearly a variety of ways in which people do so uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, again a very uh, useful and informative session. Alex did you want to add? Yeah, thank you convener it was very moving as it was equally inspiring and um, I, I think for me the takeaway was definitely the lived experience as you describe and that is um, the the reality then it was quite a, a stark reality of how little support we offer uh, transplant patients either pre or post-op and particularly around mental health and we've that we've got people who are dealing with a very unique set of circumstances, very challenging set of circumstances. It's a, it was described as a roller coaster of, uh, of emotion, particularly when you get the call in the middle of the night to come down for your transplant, only to then be uh, turned around and say, no, it's not going to happen. Um, and then subsequently as well, in, in terms of the recovery. So I, I think that for me was a real gap that if we do nothing about in this bill, we will have failed. Um, but also I was really touched by the fact that, you know, all of the, the transplant patients we met um, have been giving back in some way mm -hmm. and whether that's um, you know just on on spec meeting um, transplant patients who are waiting for an operation and talking about their experience and helping them along there was an anxiety around medication as well the, the fact that um, we are asking transplant patients to run down their supplies of uh, anti-rejection medication right to the end and before they get the repeat prescription that causes anxiety and also brexit is a concern in that that might be one of the medicines that we may struggle to get um, should we crash out with no deal. David, would you like to add? I think to the individuals who came along today to give evidence. Um, I think education was the key to one of the roles that it plays and then how we um, engage with the younger generation, especially if the age for uh, deemed consent is going to be 16. Um, 
also the lack of support, especially for mental health issues, but also it was highlighted that the organ that was donated, it was important, it was a gift. Um, and I think that was really important in the evidence that we took this morning. That's right, and I think the, 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 the significance of, of an organ as a gift is something that's fed back from, from I think, in different ways from, from all the groups. I think, I think my, one of my overall conclusions was the value of networks. Uh, uh, the, the, the transplant games were, were mentioned in our discussions, uh, but also the family donor network as well. Uh, these are important networks, and uh, I, I'm glad that in some ways simply our evidence sessions have allowed some more network building to be done by some of those involved. So can I repeat uh, the, the thanks from all of my colleagues to all of those who provided that evidence this morning. It was extremely uh, valuable and, 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 and certainly will inform our further proceedings. Thank you very much to those who give, gave that evidence. Uh, we, we move now to the first formal session of evidence on the bill. Uh, Thank you for your patience and welcome to the committee, uh, Dr. Sue Robertson, Deputy Chair of the British Medical Association, Scotland, Rachel Cackett, the Policy Advisor, uh, Royal College of Nursing, Scotland, and Mary Agnew, Assistant Director, Standards and Ethics with the General Medical Council. Uh, and um, I guess if we go straight into the, uh, I, I suppose the heart of the matter is whether uh, deemed authorization uh, will achieve the objective which I think uh, everyone has set for it, which is to increase uh, donation or whether it might uh, have some perverse negative effects instead. And I wonder if I could ask that as a general opening question uh, as to the, the, the fundamental principle of the bill and the fundamental uh, tool within the bill for uh, achieving change. Is it is it fit for purpose? Sue Robertson. Um, I feel I should... Um mention to you before I start on behalf of the British Medical Association that I am in fact a doctor that looks after patients either waiting for transplants or who have received transplants just so that you know that that's my background um, but I'll be speaking on behalf of the British Medical Association today not personally. Uh, we've long supported a move to a soft opt-out system as part of a package to deliver more transplants to patients that need them. Um, we don't think it can be done as a standalone thing. We don't think it will improve um, the numbers of organs available for transplant to help our patients unless it's done as part of an investment in the infrastructure that can support the delivery of that ethos to give us more organs available for donation. But yes, we are definitely and have been for a long time in support of this move. It's okay. First, thank you for the opportunity for the RCN to come, and it was great to sit in and listen to the feedback from your session talking to patients and families this morning. As we said in our evidence, the RCN consulted our membership back at the start of the year on a position on consent for organ and tissue donation, and overwhelmingly our membership uh, came back and supported a move to an opt-out or supporting obviously our, our Welsh members the existing legislation in Wales. Um, that support came with uh, a series of conditions um, attached to the support for a, a, an opt-out and we've detailed those in our in our response. Um, I'm happy to come back and talk about any of those within the context of how they're reflected in the the, the Scottish legislation that you're considering at the moment. Um, the one thing I would say, and you've been talking a lot from your feedback from your informal session this morning about education, and I think the, the figures that really struck us are, are among our membership was that of those who responded, 25, only 25% felt they could speak with confidence about organ donation, 22% about tissue donation, and only 10% felt that patients and their families had had much discussion on the topic in advance. Now, whilst we're clear that those who are getting into the details of authorisation should be specialist nurses in organ donation, um, and that's where the expertise to do that sits, the wider discussions that need to happen at other points um, with families to support families and individuals to, to make an informed choice is something that I do think we need to come back to in the support mechanism. So similarly, there are many other things around this legislation that need to be in place to make sure that the legislation supports an increase in successful donation. Maybe I can. 
Thank you, and thank you very much for the opportunity for the GMC to come and contribute to this discussion. Um, we're extremely supportive of the underlying aim of the bill in terms of um, increasing donation rates. We haven't actually, in our response, taken a formal position on whether this is the best way to achieve it. Um, and really, that's because our role as the medical regulator, we think these are rightly um, matters for discussion in the Parliament, with the public, um, rather than one on which we would take a position. So the sorts of points we've made are really to raise those areas is where we think there could helpfully be more, more clarity about how the bill might be expected to work in practice to support health professionals to act ethically in partnership with patients um, and their families. And I'd very much underline the theme that's been coming out already about the importance of education, both in terms of public understanding, um, but also in terms of the support available for health professionals in what can be very, very difficult circumstances and, and sensitive conversations. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. The committee has uh, conducted a survey in order to try and gauge what the impact of the bill might be and, 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 and to gauge some public opinion. And we found uh, that uh, deemed authorisation, uh, while clearly it creates a, 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 a presumption uh, in favour of transplant for those who don't opt out, it also found that the number who would opt out increased. Uh, so the, uh, and most of that was uh, from those who would have had no particular opinion beforehand. Is there, can I ask though, particularly the witnesses who've s said uh, it's a good thing and it's a policy position that you hold, is there a danger of a backlash or of uh, losing on the swings what you gain in the roundabouts by um, encouraging those who at the moment have no particular view uh, to, to, to come to a view and to, to take a negative position? Sue Robertson. Um, internationally, there is n no evidence that this is likely to reduce the rates, and in fact, it tends to have a positive effect if in association with the other measures to support it. And I think Wales is our closest country, and, and they've had similar legislative change in the last couple of years, and there's no evidence that the consent rates have gone down, and in fact, family consent rates have gone up. Probably to a great extent as a result of the public information and the education that families have had and the fact that this has become a conversation that they're much more likely to have when everybody is well in the cold light of day rather than in the most distressing day of their lives. So we think that um, it's unlikely to reduce the rates and if anything it will enhance the rates. And we also think it's really important that individuals who do not wish their organs to be used um, for transplant have an opportunity to register that wish. So I, I would agree with um, much of what Dr Robertson's just said. Um, the, it, it, the Talking to our colleagues in, in Wales, I think the important thing has been that that conversation has been supported by some of the changes that have gone on there. And that conversation is important to get to that point of informed choice. And I think for both families, for patients and for those staff who are, who are supporting discussions at the end of life, it's really important that that informed choice is there, whatever that choice is. So I think that's where our experience to date as a college has been, that the conversation is what matters, which is why we keep coming back to the issue of education. I don't know, Mary Agnew, if you wanted um, to add anything. I, I think really just, just to agree with that yeah. sentiment about informed consent and early and wide discussion being being really helpful. Okay, thank you very much. Keith Brown. Yeah, Robertson mentioned um, family consents. Um, I suppose my concern is that if this bill goes through, presumed consent will mean that the rights of the state will supersode, supersede those of individuals in cases where the individuals haven't expressed a preference. And I'm also concerned that families' rights will supersede the rights of individuals in some circumstances as well. And we heard some evidence today that the family members who are consulted, although there is a priority attached to different family members depending on their status, may disagree, um, and they can put that uh, that can put them in a difficult position. One example was one lady who mentioned that she had given consent, but uh, not for all organs, and then regretted having not done so afterwards. So. I'm just interested where the rights, where you believe the rights of the person whose organs they actually are come in relation to the rights either of the state as expressed through this uh, or families or indeed the medical profession. Uh, Sir Robertson. Um, this is a very difficult issue. Uh, and again, we come back to 
having this conversation earlier, and that's what uh, one of the main thrusts of this is. If people have the, the conversation with their loved ones about what they would wish to happen to their organs in the event of their death, then their loved ones will know that that's their wish. Um, there is obviously a situation there that sometimes family members disagree and um, that is very difficult and very distressing and it, as I've already said, can be the worst day of their lives. Um, the families would not be being asked for consent. They would be being asked for information about um, their relatives' wishes and that's perhaps an easier conversation for a family to have, I think, than the one that they have at present. Um, and I think that to have the soft opt-out part of this legislation um, means that if, if the healthcare professionals involved feel that this is just going to cause undue distress to this family, then I do think we have a duty of care to them as well. And um, as a doctor... I, th I think you have a duty of care to the family and if you feel it's going to cause undue distress, then I think there should be a situation whereby um, authorisation will not go ahead. Um, Mary Agnew? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, as a, as a doctor, your duties are first and foremost to the patient and we welcome the principle throughout the bill of doing what you can to establish that patient's um, wishes. Um, I mean, our, our principle in terms of family involvement would be about being considerate and sensitive and responsive to those close to the patient. Um, I, it was interesting looking at the reasons for patient refusal and, and often that is because those wishes weren't known. So perhaps in the context of a wider system where everyone is being encouraged to state their, their reasons and has the choice both to opt in and opt out, perhaps some of those conversations um, do become um, a, a little easier. But recognising, I mean, I would very much agree with Dr Robertson said that in situations of um, extreme distress to the family, I don't think you would want to put professionals in a, in a position where it was felt they had to somehow override um, a, a, very, a, a very distressed family. It's okay. So obviously our position is one of support for deemed consent, but the, as I said before, we, the, the, the college has taken a position that there are certain safeguards that need to be in place, and I think there are two that are really important within the context of, of the question you've asked. The first is that we're very clear that trained health professionals need to discuss the express wishes of the person who's deceased with the family. And if you look at the figures that I know you've been presented through the SPICE briefing and you look at the um, the importance of having a highly trained specialist nurse involved in that, then you see what happens and the difference that that can make in terms of authorisation rates. And it is important to go back to your point, which is that professionals who are doing this at a very difficult time for families are highly trained, sensitive to the conversations that they're having and have an ongoing relationship then with the family. But we're also very clear that no practitioner should be put in the place of having to force a donation. And our understanding is in practice that's what happens in Wales. And certainly our position is that if a family doesn't want a donation to go ahead, it should not be forced. And I think that goes back to one of the issues within which we've raised within the Scottish uh, bill uh, as, as introduced, which is around the duty to inquire. So I think it is absolutely true that the practitioners who are involved at that time, the snods who are engaged in that work, are having to do some very difficult conversations with people who are facing or just been bereaved. And it's really important that we're absolutely clear what we expect of our practitioners. And it would certainly be helpful in the course of the passage of the, the bill to understand a little more why the duty to inquire is being placed on individual practitioners rather than on an organisational level, because there will be potentially disagreements um, and while SNODs will be trained to deal with that and to manage that process and to help navigate through that it's really important that in statutory terms in legislative terms we understand the duties that we're placing our individual practitioners under. Keith Brown. Nothing but praise for the uh, people involved in this process um, today during the evidence session but we are faced with passing a law and the difficult questions have to be asked. And I think that I'm getting the sense, um, and I don't want to paraphrase and do it unfairly, but that the views of the donor really are not paramount in this. The views of the donor will be subordinated in the case of presumed consent where they've not expressed a preference to the state to allow it to go ahead. They will be subordinated to the views of the family, maybe a, 
and, and it's, it can often be a bit of chance as to which member of the family is it's consulted for various reasons. Um, if they are distressed by it, even though the person has expressed in full control of their faculties that they want to do this, that can be overturned by a family. And you've also expressed concern for the health professionals not being put in that position. You could argue that if you make it clear in the law that they're not put in that position because the views of the donor should be paramount. Um, and also, I think, uh, just last one last point, uh, Dr Robertson said that the families don't give consent. That's exactly what's been described. It will not go ahead in the areas where the family feels so strongly it shouldn't go ahead. That is the definition of consent, I would, I would have said. So it's really about the views of the donor that I'm trying to get to, because this will be, if passed, the law. I think just to clarify the, the wording of the position, I'm going to read it because I think it actually makes a, a difference. The trained health professionals must discuss the expressed wishes of the deceased person with the person's family where contactable before any donation <coughs> proceeds. And then we go on to say if a family does not want it to go ahead, it should not be forced. Um, and I do think we come back to my understanding of what this legislation is trying to do, which is to say that there needs to be a conversation about the wishes of the deceased person. And I think that is an important distinction between um, the, the wishes of the family, if you like, and the wishes of the deceased person being asked. And I do think that is an important break that our members felt was important to put in. And I think in a situation where you are dealing with people in grief, it's important that that conversation is able to be had and can also be done sensitively by people who are properly trained to do it. Anybody else? The, the, the specialist nurses and organ donation uh, demonstrated to us uh, as a committee some, some time ago the process of asking questions and the, the length and complexity that, that that can carry with it. If a family um, have the discussion about the express wishes of the deceased but the, or, or of the potential donor, but then um, decline to answer the questions, does that amount to a, a, a veto in the process? Or is that a realistic proposition? Does that happen? Is there evidence that families sometimes, either for good reason or bad, um, either because they cannot or because they choose not to, um, do not answer the questions that are asked? Rachel Cackett. Um, I, I'm sitting here not as a practitioner who's doing this every day, um, and I, I'm aware that you've got uh, colleagues from NHSBT on at the next session, so um, I, I would suggest that level of practical detail is something that I know I would uh, prefer to leave to them to answer. Miles Briggs. Thank you. Uh, convener, I wanted to just develop um, <clears throat> this uh, further around the rights of the family, because um, as Keith Brown was saying, I think it was important aspect of what could be lost actually within um, the new legislation because around 100 donors are currently lost in Scotland um, due to families refusing to donate their loved ones organs including in many cases instances where someone has actually recorded um, their wishes in the organ uh, donor register so I wanted to um, really develop further should the legislation reflect the current convention um, which effectively gives families a right of veto Sue Robertson. I think, again, perhaps we look to Wales. Um, and the family consent rates are higher in Wales than they are in Scotland. And I think that reflects perhaps the change in their legislation and the fact that the public know more now about organ donation than they ever have in the past. And I think that one of the themes that came out from your early discussion today was that education is key and if people understand what this involves and understand the benefits and the needs of patients who could be a friend of theirs, a member of their family, could be them in the future. If they understand all of those things then they are much more likely to wish to, to um, be able to help these patients by uh, by offering a gift of life to them. Um, I think anybody that I have spoken to that I've told about organ donation and we have explained to it to them in, in simple terms, um, people generally say, oh, I understand now, that makes much more sense. And I think that is key to all of this. The education of the public 
is key. The education of the health professionals as to how things might change and how the process might change, but to the public, the education, um, which is already being done to some extent. You know, we have real life stories coming out. People are seeing much more the benefits of organ donation, but still we need to educate them more and we need to help them to have those conversations. And I think that will get over much of, of the perceived problem here. Rachel Cackett. So again, I, I, I guess I come back to the statement that our members have agreed and, and how that is reflected within legislation and practice. As long as that is reflected, that is what our members are asking for. So I think the important point to come back to one we're making repeatedly is the um, investment in the infrastructure and the expertise to support the discussions that need to go around this legislation if this is what is passed, um, what we've currently are, are looking at at this stage in the process that you need those trained professionals to be involved in those discussions and that our members are not put in a position of having to force something. But I come back to the message, which is it about the expressed wishes of the deceased person. Um, how that is reflected in legislation, I, I guess there are many ways that that could be done. Um, and our understanding is in, in the Welsh legislation that is in practice what happens. I'd agree with that. I mean, the public awareness such that um, people are talking to their families about their wishes, such that this isn't all a decision taken in the heat of crisis. Um, I think you would move um, to a position where a greater proportion of families are are much more comfortable and much more understanding of, of what, what, what's going on. And I think there is a significant shift with this legislation. It, I, d I wouldn't see it as a power of veto. I think I think what we're talking about in, in terms of not, not forcing health professionals will probably in practice be be quite a small number of situations. And the risk in, in sort of saying that that it would have to go ahead in those situations, I think, is a possible consequent impact on trust in the um, medical and nursing profession. So I think that that could be quite quite a damaging route, and you would want to be able to retain that that ability to to take family views into account where they're very very strongly held, whilst seeing the patient's expressed wishes as as as, as what you ought to be following. Okay. Right. A lot of the conversations we've had with people, and because over a number of years Parliament has been looking at different bills, people in some extent think the law has already changed. And so do you have any concerns specifically around um, you know, deemed authorisation, increasing family uncertainty, actually, um, with the new bill? I, I feel like we keep coming back to the same point, but I do think it comes down to the education package that goes around, because... If what you want is uh, families to have an open conversation about what their express wish is, whether or not under this legislation they have choos chosen to opt in, opt out or do neither um, as an active choice, you want the active choice to be discussed. I know one of the issues that we've raised in our, um, in our evidence submission to you in writing is that we can see that there's uh, money going into NHSBT around the specialist nursing community and others, and that's really welcome and absolutely support that going ahead. This is this is the crucible, if you like, of where that decision-making goes ahead. But we do also, and our, and our members told us they thought there was a, a much wider need for education. I gave you some figures at the start about how many of our members who responded were comfortable with these issues. And I do think there is a, 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 a bigger set of money that's required to go out and NHSBT may not be the right people to go out and do this. It may be a government issue to, to go out and work with the wider health community because you want the conversation to be supported early so that you know if, if you're in a school with a school nurse or if you're in a, a, a GP surgery with a, a practice nurse, that we, we're not expecting those members of staff to go into the sort of expertise and detail that you would want from your snod, but you do want to be able to at least answer some some basic questions and do it in an informed way to make sure that the public can make the right choice, however they then choose to express that. One of the most, just very briefly, um, one of the most interesting aspects of this has actually been, um, you know, when people have um, made their wishes known, but actually, um, you know, issues to do with eyes, especially not being donated. And I think that's something, um, you know, I've been quite struck. It's something with this legislation maybe isn't going to um, get around the questionnaire when families are actually um, completing that. So it's something which um, I think is worth considering as well, that actually um, you know, individual organs, when you're doing that questionnaire, you know, public information around that. And, and again, from um, our group this morning, um, some of the individuals said that looking back, they would have 
um, donated eyes. But it's a very um, sensitive area and sensitive organs as well. To experience. Just come back to your to your point. Um, that again is public information. We need to teach the public what benefit their eyes could have in the event of their death if they gave them for transplantation. We need to show how grateful my patients and all patients who receive organs as a transplant, how incredibly grateful they are and how life-changing those things can be or life-saving those things can be. And I think then many people would reflect on that initial reaction, which, is, which can be, oh, I don't want to give my eyes, and reflect on whether actually they really mean that or whether now that they've heard what would happen in that situation that they may change their minds. So again, we're back to public information and public education. Thank you very much. I wonder if I can ask Mary Agnew, the way the bill is drafted at the moment, would there be any risk of uh, legal or regulatory consequences for medical professionals who uh, uh, decided, for the reasons we've discussed this morning, uh, not to proceed uh, because the family didn't wish to do so, even though there was an express uh, uh, wish by the uh, person in question to donate? Um, I think, you know, in terms of, of regulatory consequences, the, the way we approach this is whether doctors are acting in good faith on the basis of the guidance available in partnership with patients and where appropriate those close to them. And we do in our fitness to practice considerations, if something comes into us, we, we have a duty to, to look at it and see whether we need to investigate. But we take into account context. We expect the doctor to be able to justify their actions. Um, so uh, I suppose the, the short answer would be saying um, no, not on the face of it I don't see a problem but where we where we have raised some questions in terms of what we and other organizations might need to do to support doctors to understand and apply this this new law is is getting a little more clarity about what what is envisaged in terms of the duty to inquire insofar as it as it applies to the wider healthcare team as opposed to the specialist nurses involved um, recognizing that we would want to see some sort of ideally separation between the decisions a doctor is making about that patient's treatment and uh, the set of decisions around um, possible organ donation, organ and tissue donation, really sensitive conversations that need careful and trained handling. So, so really understanding um, what sorts of circumstances might the duty to in inquire apply to to a doctor, um, and what sort of training and support <coughs> would would be made available to them to handle those conversations. I think those are some of the areas we'd be be, be keen to to see explored as the bill progresses. Thank you very much, uh, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Vina, and good morning to the panel. Um, as I've already been mentioned today, this, this, this is going to be a, a, a law, um, and uh, I think it was Keith Brown said, if we're going to create law, clarity is absolutely uh, paramount here. And one of the things that strikes me is that sitting alongside uh, deemed authorisation will also be opt-in. And given there's a, there's a different connotation to opting in, as opposed to not opting out. I wonder if you think that that, that, that may increase sort of family uncertainty and, and that potential to increase uh, refusal rates. Rachel Cackett. As a college, our position is that we have supported um, uh, an, an opt-out system um, with the conditions attached. So exactly how that then frames, I guess, as a legislative answer. The clarity issue, though, is absolutely key. And I think if you look through the conditions that our members said were really important to them, clarity keeps coming out. So whether that's down to uh, clarity over which organs are included and, and which are not within deemed consent, um, but certainly you'll also see from our submission that we've raised a number of times that there isn't always clarity in the bill or the documents that accompany the bill to make it very easy to understand exactly what is being proposed in, in all situations. And I think whatever system is chosen, um, if this legislation were to go ahead, the, the most important point is that if we want people to make informed choice, however that choice is made, we have to be 100% clear what sort of choice they're making and about what. Um, and that will then make practitioners' lives a great deal simpler and families' lives a great deal simpler when they're trying to have these conversations at a point of, of real grief. 
Um, and if it's not clear, then I think we do everyone a disservice. So uh, we wouldn't have a position on exactly how that is framed in the legislation. But the important point is whatever choice is made, it has to be absolutely clear to all, us all what is being chosen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Sue Robertson. I think um, the BME position reflects that of the RCN, which is that clarity is key, along with communication. So uh, clarity on what the change in legislation would mean to the public is key. Um, the fact that if you opted out, then your your wishes would be registered. I think a point on, on the, the bill as written at the moment would be that um, at present you require a written confirmation of an opt-out, and we feel that that um, makes it harder to opt-out, and, and it's slightly contrary to, our, to making it easy if you do not wish to give your organs to opt-out just as easy as it is to opt-in, and we think perhaps that might be a situation you may not require written confirmation of opt-out, much as we don't at present. Um, but yes, I can understand the concern about having opt-out, opt-in and deemed consent at the same time. And I, I think that has to be really carefully managed. But I think that certainly in Wales, what they did was they left opt-in as an option because some people really wanted to do that. And if people want to opt-in actively, I don't think that we should stop them doing that. Um, as long as they know that if they don't opt-in, we presume, unless they've opt out, that that they wish their organs to be donated. Then I think having the ability to opt in if they wish to do so is fine. We know that at the moment about 50% of the Scottish population have opted in. But actually, if you ask people, 9 and 10 would say they wish their organs to be donated. So we're looking for that 40% there that haven't at present opted in, but that actually do want their organs to be donated. And those are the people that have, we want to have that conversation with their families because we know they actually really want their organs to be donated. But yes, I can understand the concern, I, but I think that we would leave the opt-in option too. I'm not sure whether that was clear. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I followed it. I think I think the the connotation of you know making the positive step to opt in is different from not opting out. I think that 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 that's the, the issue. And I'm looking at it from the family perspective here of on in that in that uh, horrible situation that, uh, of of, of um, you know having that conversation. Uh, around the, the, one of the hardest times uh, in their life, and from their perspective, having uh, if if they have said if you can say to them, your loved one had opted in and consented to you know these these organs being donated is an easier start to a conversation than the opt in. And I think what, what I think what I'm, I'm I'm getting to here really is is that. Um, should we should we be in a situation where we're looking for a, a, to better address a situation where um, we can create an environment where everybody everybody has that option to opt in or opt out? Should that be where we're heading? Um, I'll take you back to at present. Everybody has the ability to opt in positively, and it's very easy for them to do so. But people have busy lives and they just don't get round to it. And people think it's never going to happen to me. Um, and there are, you know, four out of ten people in Scotland who would wish their organs to be donated if you ask them, but haven't opted in. Um, and their families may well at present know that they wish to do that, but they just haven't got round to officially registering that. Um, and I think that it's clear that some people wish to opt in. If you change legislation and you make it clear to them that they can opt in if they want, they can opt out if they want. Um, but if they do neither, then it is presumed that they wish their organs to be donated. I think that's better than the system that we have now. I'm one of the 40%. Okay. 
that 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 uh, this this conversation that we've had here has prompted me to, you know, to, to, to go and make make that decision. What I'm asking, I suppose, is is uh, perhaps around there are several pit, um, uh, sort of things in life that everybody goes through. You know, getting your national insurance number when you turn 16, or, or perhaps when you go for your driving license, or whatever. All all these things are, I think have the potential to to put in front that that option for everybody. Um, I think my question is, I think we have to get this absolutely right, and that comes back to clarity. I think my question to you then is, if we can create that environment where that dis everybody has the option to make that decision, is that not a, would, that, would that not be a more positive situation than just presumed consent? Can I come back on that? I think you've just you've just made the argument for presumed consent by saying I'm one of those forty percent. The problem is that many of us, as we age, don't get sent a new driving license, and we don't register with a new GP if we happen to live in the same area, and perhaps we don't use the library anymore because we buy our books online. So actually, it doesn't pop up in front of us, and so we never get round to it. I think, sorry. Very quickly, very quickly. <laughs> My <laughs> so I, I, look, I think the, the outcome we want here is, is, I think we're all agreed, is that we want more donation. My point is actually... It's never been put in front of me. I'm asking, should we be creating an environment where it's, it is put in front of everyone as part of this legislation? I guess the, we come back to the point that legislation is part of uh, a whole panoply of actions that need to be taken to increase donation rates. So, yes, you know, when I receive something in the post, something that hits me in the face and asks me the question and m makes sure that I'm having that discussion so that my loved ones are informed about my wishes is important as much as it is for you. But also our members were clear when we asked them detailed questions around uh, an opt out that 71% of our members supported that as one tool to increase donation rates. The thing is, I don't think it's the only tool um, that should be on the table. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. I need to remind everybody I am a former liver transplant nurse and I have been involved in retrieval as well as kidney and pancreas transplants as well. So um, I'm interested in, uh, simply put, deemed authorisation allows a conversation to begin exactly as Brian's describing. So I think uh, as we're pursuing that, I'm interested in the, the BMA's information about barriers to donation might be that people are not really familiar or m maybe a bit scared of if if I choose to donate my solid organs that's great but then we're now moving into processes where there's new procedures that are taking place like face transplants which can freak people out when you start talking about that or even hand transplants so um, in the submission from the BMA it talks about the 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 ability to exclude certain parts. So I'm interested to know if you think that yes. that is a supportive, it's a good way to proceed so that we can be explicit about which um, tissues, organs that are uh, potentially available. Um, it's, it's a difficult one because time moves on and medical advances are very rapid and so things change. Again, this would be one for public information. Um, we are, the key here is to try and increase the, the number of organs available for patients. And uh, we do not want there to be a situation where somebody is not clear about what they are authorizing. And I think that uh, the conversation again needs to be had in the public about what we're actually talking about here. Are we talking about presumed consent to use any part of your body for transplantation or are we talking about the common organs that we use for donation and do we leave space for people to exclude certain parts of their body? If it means that people are better educated and have more ability to have their wishes respected when they die, 
then I think that there should be places whereby people can exclude organs. Yes, I think that's our view. Rachel Kakin. I mean, very similarly, one of the, 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 the lines that the college has put against its support for, for an opt-out is that the um, scheme has to be very clear of what's included and what's not, so that we come back to that, that point of clarity. And the other thing that we have said is that the opt-out should be limited to donations for transplantation and that everything else should require express authorization. So there are those limitations. Uh, and I think from what our members have said to us, that is a helpful way to proceed um, if what we're looking to is to try and increase rates. I'll, I'll ask my other uh, supplementary. It's about the duty to inquire as well. Um, the bill sets out that if a reasonable person who would be convinced by the information that the potential donors' latest view that they were unwilling to donate, then donation would uh, it cannot go ahead. So um, I would be interested to know if you think there needs to be more detail on the standard of evidence required in order to override donation. Who would like to? Uh, Rachel Cackett. Yeah, it's an issue that we raised in, in our evidence, which is the duty to inquire, which falls on individual health professionals. And obviously it's very often nurses who are in the situation of negotiating that process with families. So we think that there is definitely a, a question to be asked, which is, is that rightly placed on individuals? That's question one. And question two is, if, if that is the way the bill is to proceed, then we have to be very, very clear with our members um, what does that actually mean for them in terms of their practice? The last thing we want is a bill that supports defensive practice because individual practitioners are concerned about the implications of what a statutory duty to inquire might result in. So I think there are there are two questions to be answered there. We certainly don't have the answers to those, but it, it, they feel important questions as the bill goes forward. Um, practitioners need to know that they are operating um, with great sensitivity with a, the support of clarity of what we're asking them to do in these situations. Just what she says, we, we, are, we think that um, the views of the individual are paramount about what happens to, to their organs. So if somebody has changed their mind and there is evidence of that, then that, that seems right not to proceed with donation, but clarity around about what evidence is required, I think, is is very important, um, and it uh, it's very important for the public to know, but it's also very important for the healthcare professionals involved at that time. Does it need to be in primary legislation? I don't know if Mary Agnew has a view from a regulator's point of view. Um, uh, no, no strong way to about the best way to achieve it in in. Um, legislative terms, my 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 hunch is it probably doesn't need to be on the on the face of the bill, but it does come back to what what goes uh, with the bill further down the line in terms of support. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. I, I think we come back to the point, which is what is on primary legislation is an individual duty to inquire, and that I think is where we first need the investigation to be. Is that the most appropriate way of dealing with what I think is a you know, a reasonable request, which is to say the conversation, which is our position, needs to happen with the family in case the, the individual has changed their mind since they last formally perhaps opted in onto the register. There needs to be that discussion. Um, how that is done needs to be done in a way that if there is a statutory duty, there is equally something which makes absolutely clear what that statutory expectation is. Now, whether that's done through regulation or guidance or wherever, but it needs to be we need a fail-safe system for our practitioners to be able to operate and for the intent of the bill to then be realised. Thank you very much. Sandra White. Thank you very much, um, convener, and, and welcome as well. <clears throat> I think one thing I've learned, certainly from this bill anyway, if I spoke to anyone, my family or anyone outside, about organ donation, they understand about opt-in, opt-out, but they don't understand anything else. And from the private you know, talks we've had with uh, various witnesses as well. It's much more complicated than that, and it's very, very emotional as well. And one of the areas which really presented to me, and I didn't know anything about it, was the pre-death procedures and just how that affects families within a 36-hour period. Now, we spoke about clarity and education, and this bill looks about clarifying certain procedures 
when you know they're not clinically dead and that is going to be in legislation if deemed consent is there but having spoken to witnesses um, not just today but in previous weeks as well there has been some concerns around uh, pds and in particular uh, you know is it a conflict of interest with doctors that's one of the issues that was raised with us um does it pose a you know a danger or a significant change to to the bill if PDS is uh, authorised there and uh, if it's carried out under deemed authorisation, should you always have express consent? I know that's three sort of questions all in one, but it certainly did you know surprise me just how involved people have to be in regards to deemed consent. And as I'd said earlier, I honestly didn't realise that. Um, Families uh, could actually ask; they could actually witness the actual procedures if they, if they wished to, and that the bodies were still worn uh, in, in certain cases. And it was a real surprise to me. So I just wonder, you know, three questions that are posed. You know, what your thoughts are on that, and you want me to pose them again? <laughs> Two death procedures is what. what yes. We're after. <laughs> Thanks, Sandra. Who would like to start? This again is a sensitive area, but an important one within the bill. Sue Robertson. Um, it is a medical professional or a nursing professional's responsibility, paramount responsibility is the care of the patient in front of them at that time. And so anything that would potentially put that patient at risk or at harm would be something that we would not support. However, if you are in that situation and you have a patient who wishes to have their organs used for donation, then if they wish that to happen, then the pre-death procedures are part of that organ donation happening. And again, we go back to public information, teaching people what it involves so that there aren't, um, there's nothing hidden, you know, that it's clear to people what they are putting their bodies through in order that their organs could be used in the event of their death when they don't need them anymore. And um, I think if you educate the public about what these things are and why they're done, and you ensure and we ensure that everything that is done is for the good of the patient in front of us, that includes continuing to respect their wishes after their death. Yeah, really, I very, yeah. very much agree with Dr. Robertson there. I mean, we're, we're currently actually consulting on, on revised guidance on consent, and our, our general principle is that, you know, it, it's, actually, it's really vital that, that patients have good, accurate information about the types of procedures that they may undergo. So we would see sort of greater public awareness of these sorts of procedures being part of what's needed in terms of public information and awareness campaign. And of course, there's a range here. There are some things that are sort of minimally invasive, not, not particularly harmful, that, that are probably less, less controversial. But I, th I think it's an area where there's, there's a limited public understanding of what might be involved. And br bringing that into the conversation um, would be important. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, certainly, I didn't know anything about the pre death and I don't think anyone does either. Um, I don't know the reason for that. But when you're saying about clarity and education, uh, when people you know, put forward and they opt in, uh, should that be in writing that they're, they're informed about what may happen? Because obviously, some organs can't survive after 24 hours, 36 hours. So it's important that you know, they are removed as quickly as possible. Uh, do you think people should be informed in writing with that, or is it just once it happens, then people are told about this? This this is a procedure you're going to go through, or should it be once you opt in as a donor, should you be told that as a donor this is part and parcel of what will happen? Sue Robertson. Um, I would have thought that as part of any legis legislative change, that a public information is important and people should have access to written information if they wish to read it, um, but that that should be access to the public at any point in their lives rather than just at the point of donation. And I think that, again, what we would hope, what the BMA supports is a move to, to a situation whereby organ donation is the norm. And... Um, <coughs> That's a long-term ambition, but um, 
public information and information about the processes that around organ donation are all part of that. Gee, there's just, I'm sorry, it was about a legal issue. <coughs> it was for, for, for Mary Ag and you, I know that you mentioned about um, duty to inquire and some issues, particularly for the Law Society, had picked up in the aspects of, uh, you know, pre-death pre um, procedures. And I just wondered if um, that would have any legal aspects, you know, for, for yourselves or the organisation in regards to people's assumptions or whatever it may be. I mean, I think it comes down to that that sort of clarity point. I mean, one of the, the questions we had at an earlier stage in, in the consultation was was how it fits with the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act and, and the particular situations taken into account where, where people may, may lack capacity. So, again, it's one... Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure what the legal ramifications would be at the moment, but it's an area we'd be keen to give as much clarity to practitioners as possible to make sure that they, they feel confident in af acting ethically and within the law. Thank you. Thank you. Question for clarification. Just a quick clarification. Pre-death procedures are procedures such as intravenous lines that might be put in or medication that would improve organ perfusion. It's procedures that would might be uh, performed already, so given certain IV medication. But once a decision is made to donate, that's when procedures that are carried out might be simple things like change of medication, increasing doses. So can you clarify what pre-death procedures are? Because I think uh, it, it, it's not about doing stuff to people. It's about helping support once decisions to donate are made. Is that correct? Uh, that's, that is certainly how we would see it. And that, again, is, is part of that education, that if you wish your organs to be used in the event of your death for transplantation, that um, part of that wish is to try and ensure that those transplants would be as much benefit as they could be to somebody else. Um, and I think that being very clear about what procedures at that time, these will change over the years as, as medicine changes, but it needs to be very clear that the, that the public know what, what that involves. And I think at present they perhaps Thank don't. Thank you. Uh, Alec Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Kamina. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for coming to see us today. Um, we, as a committee, had an uh, informal evidence session this morning with recipients of organ donations. Uh, it was a very inspiring um, as a session. And one of the things that came out of this was a discussion about the need for those conversations that have to happen That if we're to, to generate an uptick in the number of people who are on our organ donor lists. Um, and one of the suggestions that came from a gentleman who is an organ donor recipient was that, you know, with the organ register, you could have a counter signatory box so that your nice of kin was aware and had almost co consented with this to you. Um, that might not be practical, and I understand that, but would there be something that we can do around the guidance of this bill to generate those conversations if, with the donor list which is being retained, that a notification process was adopted or um, something like that? Would that help to engender those conversations so that? when people said, oh, he was an organ donor, it's not a surprise to their next of kin. Can I, sorry, can I yeah. Yeah. when you say notification process. So, so you could tick a box, if you're registered, because we're going to keep the organ donor register. Um, if you're a new subscriber to that, then perhaps there's a field that you could choose to uh, check, which would send an email to your next of kin just to say, so they're so notified that you have just signed up to that, even if you don't get around to talking about it. It's just a, an automatic thing that happens as, as part of that process. Rachel Kagan. So, I, I, I mean, I, I think we need to think through how you have that conversation. Um, and I think it's important that those conversations between those who are listed in the bill as the people who may end up making or not making the decision, but having the discussion with the people around your... Um, your express intent are understanding what that express intent is and, and I think conversation is important um, I, I can only speak personally I think I would find it quite hard to receive an email telling me someone I loved was about it but, but I, I understand the point and I think we need to look as the support around if this legislation were to go forward 
all of the options that are out there to support those conversations to happen. And I think it's a really interesting thought about how do you how do you use the resources that we have, which would include potentially keeping the opt in, which is the proposal at the moment. How do you use that to encourage a conversation so that none of this, you know, you're going to be dealing with a big enough shock at the point when you're having to have this conversation. Um, the fewer of those there are, the, the better. Um, so I think anything that we can discuss that may go around the bill to support that is a, a really good thing. Mm -hmm. I think it is incumbent on this committee not just to uh, tease out the clauses and sections of this bill as they stand, but look at how we can improve the landscape for um, triggering those conversations. Sorry, did you want to come in, Dr. Robertson? Yeah, um, I wonder whether instead of that, where I'm concerned about the lack of conversation there, perhaps the email should come to the person who registers to say, remember to talk to your family remember to discuss it with them. And I think that would be a much more positive thing than just an email that tells you. I think that point is well made and, and taken in the spirit it's offered. Um, the second area I'd like to ask about was the lived experience that we've had of um, the, the recipients that we met this morning. And I think this goes for uh, families of donor patients as well, because they, they talked, particularly those who are on transplant waiting lists, of... Uh, huge pressure on their mental health um just in terms of the the roller coaster that they described in terms of the late night phone calls being driven to hospital only to be turned around and said well this isn't actually the match we thought it was or or the organs aren't viable um and that creating huge pressure and strain on relationships and them not having any real specialist mental health care or counseling and is that a gap in our society do we need to have provision um specialist teams which are dedicated to helping those firstly on transplant lists but to support them after the fact and to support the families of donor patients in in the round can i speak as a professional rather than on behalf of the bma here um having done a a, a clinic on monday when all my patients were transplant recipients and then gone and looked after the patients on dialysis waiting for, for our kidney in the afternoon. Um, I think that there's a huge amount of pressure and that emotional roller coaster that you describe of getting the phone call. You know, if you're in Dumfries or Stranraer driving or being driven all the way to the transplant unit and then waiting to find out whether this is the one that's going to be yours is huge. And I think the pressure of of having a failing organ, whether it's your kidneys or your lungs or your heart or your liver, is huge on your mental health. And uh, at present in Scotland, I think that we have too little resource um, applied to this group of patients before, during and after um, transplant um, or indeed for the patients for whom transplant is not an option. And so any increased investment and support that we can have for patients in those groups would be very, very gratefully accepted and is very needed. Yes. Rachel Cackett. So we've had many conversations around tables like this about the, the pressures on mental health services in Scotland, and we know that there are significant gaps and um, whilst announcements have come forward to, to try and address some of those, you know, we're, we're, we're really catching up. And clearly, as you've said from your experience, this is a, a patient group that has very particular needs. The statement that the RCM put out in its position on deemed consent was very clear that its first um, condition that we wanted to attach to that support was that sufficient resources are made available to define and support the additional infrastructure and capacity required to increase the rate of successful donation. And I think we chose that wording very, very carefully. This wasn't just about increasing the, the, the rate of donation. It was increasing the rate of successful donation. And that requires us to also then look at that recipient population and the well-being of people who are receiving donations to be able to, to, to sort of go on and have a success um, of that. And we would be wrong if we were thinking of parity of esteem not to consider both their physical and mental health and well-being in that consideration. David Stewart. Thank you, Convener. I'm going to thank the panel for coming along and for the evidence to date. Um, could the panel outline, in their view, um, the best practice that's provided in Spain towards organisation, which is very much set up as one of the most successful countries in Europe? 
who's, who's, a, who's an expert on Spanish uh, transplantation. Rachel <laughs> Well, actually, it's just to say that um, I, I'm aware I had a, a long conversation with a, a colleague who you're going to be speaking to shortly who, who knows a great deal more about the detail of, of Spain and how that compares to uh, what's being proposed in Scotland than I do. So rather than giving you an ill-informed response, uh, I would defer to their contribution. Thank you very much. Um, well, perhaps I could help out and provide a few a bits of information. It's always difficult, of course, to compare countries with different cultures and different systems. But in very simple terms, um, Spicer provides some information to us today that the, if you look at the, the UK donation rate is half that of Spain, even if you adjust for the family refusal rates. Uh, and one of the arguments, I think, that Spain's put forward is that they have a very strong system of transplant coordinators, donor detection programmes and great provision of intensive care beds. I mean, whilst of course I understand that the bill is focusing qu um, quite strongly on, on consent and different systems of consent, um, which I'll put to one side, is are we maybe missing a trick here? Is there other wider things perhaps we should be introducing into the bill as a, as a committee that would focus on some of these areas, which obviously Spain has shown is to be extremely successful? Sir Robertson. I think we're very clear that um, uh, the, the, the little I do know about Spain involves the fact that the infrastructure set up in Spain supports as much transplantation as, as they can. And I think there is no point in changing legislation if your infrastructure cannot support the increase in organ donation. So far, the Scottish Government and the transplant uh, networks have done a huge amount to improve the rates of transplantation in Scotland. Um, and when you meet the transplant surgeons at the moment, you meet a bunch of very tired people. Um, they're working really hard. And I think that not to invest in that infrastructure, not to make it there so that it can deliver the aim of this legislation would be very much a missed trick. I, I think it, it may not be the job of this committee in this situation. I don't know how politics works, really. Um, but it's very important you have the infrastructure to deliver this, and that includes ITU beds. It includes enough specialist nurses highly trained to have these very sensitive conversations and to make this work as easily as it can for families of potential donors and for recipients and their families, but also to have enough transplant surgeons so that um, the transplant can go ahead as speedily as possible, um, safely and well for everyone involved. You know, th there's no mm. point in changing legislation if sure. you don't have the system to so support the, it. So the um, system of intensive care beds in Spain is crucially important to make sure, I think it was Rachel's point, about successful donations is absolutely vital, isn't it? And it may be that it's not for this legislation. It may be a wider issue for Scottish Government to take this forward in terms of building up capacity in the Scottish Health Service. Um, but am I correct in assuming, Dr Robertson, you, there is some best practice in Spain you think could be successfully applied to Scotland? I think that um, I, I would expect that our transplant networks, our, our uh, transplant surgeons and our specialist nurses and their networks um, would be able to advise as to what they think we need in Scotland in order to deliver an increase in transplant rates. And I would, I would acquiesce to their um, better knowledge in this situation. We have a, a very highly trained, very highly motivated group of people who um, who are very knowledgeable, and, and I would ask them. Uh, David Torrance. In Wales, um, deemed consent applies to people um, age 18 and over. In Scotland, deemed authorisation will apply to individuals who are 16 and over. Do witnesses agree with the age of 16 be age for deemed authorisation that would apply in Scotland? Sue Robertson. Um, the BME is very supportive of 16 as they as the age um, to be used at this point. And we also think that um, from the age of 12, there are um, some young people who are well enough informed to make decisions, but um, we feel that 16 is the age by which um, we would consider the right age for this bill, yes. 
So the position of the RCN is that this should be limited to adults and that consent for those who are not adults should remain as is. And I guess we come back to a pretty persistent question, which is 16 or 18 in Scotland. And, and this isn't the first piece of legislation where we've had that debate. So uh, I guess from our perspective as, as the college, um, we're not going to take a position on what constitutes an adult in law for this legislation but we are very clear that this is for adults however that is defined within any of the four countries of the, the UK. Really, I knew you will have responsibility for regulating all four countries of the United Kingdom so how does the 16 issue uh, look from your point of view? Um, I mean we haven't taken a formal position on 16 I mean I would say it broadly fits with our, our wider guidance on on uh, not to 18 year olds and that um, the wider position under the Mental Capacity Act, for example. Um, I mean, I think it will be interesting to see see the full debate on that. We will obviously um, work with what, whatever um, th this this committee decides. Um, but certainly, in terms of you know maturity of young people to think about these issues and consent to them, particularly in the context of a widespread public awareness campaign, um, a, a, you know, a, a personal view would be there there is a case for for sixteen. Excellent. Thank. David, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, the reason, the reason I'm asked that is from the witnesses um, in the panel last week. Um, some of them seen there could be a, a difficulty with a transplant of an organ if it was not suitable in Scotland and if it was to go to a country where 18 was deemed as the age of consent. Have you any thoughts on that at all? Maybe I is there a cross-border issue? I think, um, I think there could be, and I think NHS Blood and Transport will probably be be better place to, to, to talk you through um, through some of those questions. Um. Thank you very much. Can I thank the witnesses for a very informative and stimulating session? Uh, we will suspend briefly uh, to allow for a change of witnesses, uh, but thank you very much. And. Uh,
We now move to our second formal panel session of the morning uh, with uh, witnesses, expert witnesses on the Human Tissue Authorisation Bill. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome to the committee Dr Stephen Cole, consultant in intensive care medicine at Nine Wells, representing the Scottish Intensive Care Society. Leslie Logan, uh, uh, whom we welcome again, who is the Regional Manager for Organ Donation Scotland with NHS Blood and Transplant, and Professor Mark Turner, Medical Director and Designated Individual on Tissues and Cells with the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service. Welcome to you all. I know um, you will have followed some of the previous evidence uh, that we've received, and I would like to start um, again with a general question on the fundamental uh, objective or, or principle of the Bill around deemed authorisation in place of the current system and ask, ask your views on whether this will indeed uh, potentially achieve the objective of increasing the number of successful donations. Who would like to start? Okay. Leslie Logan. Okay, um, <clears throat> I agree with previous speakers that I don't think that a change in legislation by itself will make a difference. I think that by starting a national conversation about organ donation and by addressing educational concerns earlier, we will affect a culture change, which in time, um, just a hope as the Welsh are beginning to feel, um, will make a difference. So the halo effect of introducing a change in legislation, I think, will make a difference. There are one category of um, patient families who we speak to, and those are those where they are uncertain of their loved one's wishes. Um, and therefore they err on the side of caution and say no to donation. Um, the deemed element um, or the deemed part of any legislation change may help there. Thank you very much. Stephen Cole. Um, thank you, Mr Kavina. Um, there, there's a mixed range of views within the community of intensive care around Scotland on, on this legislation. Um, I think that, as uh, Leslie said, there, there are some potential benefits from it. I think one of the things that we as a group are concerned about is, is the, at the moment we have the, the power of um, the wish, the gift. Um, with the new legislation, that, that may, may be lost. And we're also very concerned that, that these are a group of, of patients who we've, we've heard about um, earlier in the session um, whose families are going through the worst days of their lives. They are coming to terms with the fact somebody they care about is dying, that everything in intensive care that we have tried to do to keep them alive has failed and that, that death is, is the, next, the next step. So this is not a normal set of circumstances uh, for those families. And it's, I think we have concerns that, that anything which, which deems what may happen to them after death may end up coming between us and these families in terms of the level of trust that we currently have. Mark Turner. Thank you, Kavina. We agree with, um, with Leslie and with the previous speakers. Um, I think that... Um, Probably the key issue here is the public engagements that we engage in both at a Scottish governmental level um, and as individual organisations with the public, um, and but also the support that we give to clinical colleagues um, in, in having these very difficult conversations. Um, so I think those are, those are the, the key elements in um, building on deemed authorisation to a successful increase in organ and tissue donation rates. Clearly, as I mentioned to the previous uh, panel, one of the consequences of uh, uh, a, a heightened awareness and greater debate is that the number of people choosing to opt out may also increase. Uh, do any of the panel have any concerns about that, or is that um, more than offset by the increase in awareness of those who, who may wish to support organ donation? I don't think that we have <clears throat> any concerns about that, but we do know that people change their minds. So equally, somebody who has opted in may change their mind, and equally, somebody who has opted out may then change their mind. So in future, you could have the scenario where someone has opted out, but then a loved one has received the gift of a kidney transplant, but they don't, they don't then get round to opting back in. So from my services perspective, we would plan really to approach all families where organ donation is possible to ascertain whether any change of expressed wish has happened. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Cole. So um, 
I, I think it's really important for the committee to, uh, to, to realise that we've come such a long way in the last 10 years in terms of organ donation. I speak to families on a, a weekly basis around the end of life conversation and it was not uncommon in the past for people to have no idea about organ donation and what, what may or may not happen. It's very rare indeed now to know, to come to speak to a family who, don't, who aren't aware of it, who don't have a view. So I think your, your point is well made that people, people are now more crystallised in their views and certainly public awareness um, is far greater than it was um, a decade ago. That's a very interesting observation and that relates to the 2006 Act. So the question is really, I guess, with this bill is whether uh, a further change in the law of itself will uh, uh, further increase that awareness. Uh, any views, Mark Turner? I don't have anything to add to my Th colleagues. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Keith Brown. Um, sorry to return to a previous uh, topic, but uh, I was interested in the discussion we just had. I'm not sure if all three of you were able to listen to all of that, but um, Miles Briggs had asked the question pretty straightforwardly about whether what is in effect the practical um, reality just now that there's family um, vetoes, if you want to put it that way, or family consent is required and where it's expressed it would not be overridden. And I think Miles's question was, should that then be in the bill because one thing that everyone seems to agree on is the need for clarity. I had the impression from the last three panellists that they didn't really want to answer that or didn't answer that, uh, maybe because they want to see the current practice rolled forward. But I'd just be interested in your views. I think it would be really helpful to the committee to know the extent to which clarity should cover this point, and not least because the individual, the donor, having expressed a wish, surely must have some expectation that that wish will be observed um, subsequent to their death. So just be interested in your view as to whether we should write in if there should still be this family veto and whether it should be written to the bill. Who would like to start? Stephen Cole. I think it's a really well-made point. So, so what happens at the moment is that we would approach a family um, and had communicate with the family and first and foremost we would make sure that the family understood that there was nothing more that we could do for their um, relative in intensive care. And only when they've understood and accepted that point would we then move on to any end of life conversations. We do that collaboratively, myself as an intensive care consultant and the specialist nurse for organ donation. And we, we listen to families' views. Um, I, I, having dealt with this on a, on a daily, weekly basis, I would find it difficult in my profession to, to override the wishes of expressed by the relatives of those patients. So if a patient's family said, yes, he signed up to the organ donor register, it was an expression of a wish at a point in time, I now have more information which says this is actually not what he or she wanted, then as, as the intensive care consultant speaking to that family, I would listen to that. Um, it, I don't think that we can push families into a situation where <coughs> donation is forced through again against their wishes. I would find that um, a very difficult situation to be in. So in context, this only happens in Scotland around six times a year. There are only six occasions in a year where a family override someone's decision. Of those six occasions, probably around half of them you could argue are not in fact overrides because what happens is someone signs on the organ donor register and then tells their family, I've signed on the organ donor register, but if that time comes, I want you to make the final decision. So the reality is three times a year in Scotland, we have a family um, who maybe have discord. There may be a mother and a father who can't make a decision about a child. And to be fair, we're trained to manage that situation. Um, we will have a conversation with the family about perhaps a limited donation, donation of um, kidneys and liver, abdominal organs, because people, as we know, are, are very um, emotionally attached to the heart, for example, in, in a child. So we are trained to deal with those conversations and operationally, um, overrides aren't a huge issue to us. 
I think that they can be managed well by asking a series of questions, even, you know, what conversation did you have? When did they have the conversation? What did they say? And I guess the, the final point to make is that if somebody has a registered um, or, um, or had an expressed wish, we're not approaching the family for their permission. So I'm paraphrasing also, but, but we would say Johnny was on the organ donor register, therefore he indicated his support for organ donation, so let's work together to make that happen for him. Equally in the future, um, Johnny didn't opt out of organ donation, indicating a support for it, Let's work together to see if we can make that happen for him. Or wording, you know, a, a long, you know, I'm under pressure a little bit. But, you know, it is, we can have those conversations, but overrides really don't happen as frequently, I think, um, in Scotland as perhaps they happen elsewhere in the UK. And that's because we do have 51, 52% on the organ donor register and very high public awareness. And um, we're finding certainly now that families are raising the subject of organ donation with our intensive care colleagues. Our turn. Uh, this is clearly a very difficult issue. Um, in my view, from, a, from an ethical perspective, clearly one should give primacy to the views of the donor himself or herself. Having said that, in reality, particularly for tissue donors, um, we need to ask the same kind of broad range of donor selection questions as we would apply to a blood donation, uh, for example. So they're very extensive um, to protect the quality and the safety of the of the tissue that's going to be transplanted into a recipient. Um, of course, the seminal difference is that for tissue donation, the, the donor is no longer with us. So the reality is those questions have to be asked of the family. So I would suggest that <clears throat> in reality, the family could in fact have a de facto veto by simply refusing to ask, to answer um, the, the donor selection questions, in which case we couldn't proceed with the donation in any case. So just to look up, I didn't quite get from, I, I'm assuming the answer to from all three of you then is no, it shouldn't be written into the face of the bill. We, we've never had a family ever um, not want to answer the questions around, you know, lifestyle, health care choices. Um, so, yeah. That's very interesting. It's never happened. Uh, Mark Turner, you say it might happen if a family was reluctant to go f ahead. At the moment, families, of course, can decline to give their yeah. authorization yeah. so that so they can do that directly. Um, in, in a scenario, for example, where the, the donor appeared to express their wish to donate, but the family are very opposed, if there is a, if there is a legal requirement to say that the clinicians can override the family wishes, I'm only pointing out that actually by the simple by simply not answering the questions that we ask them, the, the donation cannot proceed in any case for, for patient safety reasons. So, so the, view, the general view is it shouldn't be a legal requirement and your additional point is that even if it was, it wouldn't necessarily be effective. I don't think you could yeah. write into law a requirement for relatives to answer yeah. questions. Yeah. Understood. Miles Briggs. Um, thank you. I just wanted um, <clears throat> to maybe develop that a bit further. Firstly, um, to put on record actually from the group we had this morning, um, just how grateful they were to the teams who had um, worked with them um, and their understanding. And it was good to hear um, the positive experience that they'd all had. Um, and then beyond actually donation, um, two of the individuals I saw actually had their medal with them. Um, it's the first time they'd actually worn it. Um, and so it was, these sorts of aspects were important and I think hopefully can be developed. But to go back to the point of families and, and in terms of, I think more the confused message which this legislation might actually um, send out at this at a sort of time when you know families are tired at a point in their lives when you know their world is collapsing around them that could actually deemed authorization increase family uncer uncertainty and then refusal rates um, stay the same and it, the information we were given suggested that around 100 donors are lost in Scotland every year due to families refusing to donate their loved ones' organs. Around, we've, uh, this year so far, we've approached 158 families, um, and by the end of the year, it'll be close on, on 200. Um, 
consent rates or authorisation rates this year are up, but you're you're correct. There are a number of high number of families that still say no, um, and you know we're ever striving to provide information to make that process <coughs> as simple and streamlined for them and as as non stressful as we can. Yep, um, I think it might might be helpful for the committee to know that the totality of um, of of intensive care. So last year, 2017, approximately 10,000 critically ill patients were admitted uh, to intensive care units around Scotland. These are overwhelmingly patients who would not survive unless they were admitted. They required in ventilation, uh, inotropes to support the heart, etc. Approximately 1,400 of those, so 14, 15 percent, uh, died in intensive care. So that represents the totality of um, the potential pool of of donors and as Leslie just said we approached just over 150 of those patients the, the reason for that is that um, many patients die in intensive care in an uncontrolled way despite our best efforts to try to keep them alive they just continue to deteriorate and, and die and for organ donation to be a consideration there needs to be an element of control in terms of the, in terms of the process thank you Okay, thank you very much, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Fina, and, and good afternoon, Pam. Nice to see you again, uh, Leslie. I, I'm, I'm going to go back to the, the, the situation I was I was uh, exploring earlier on, and, and, and the reason I'm doing that is because in creating this bill and creating this legislation, as has been said before, clarity is, is, is absolute paramount, and, and, and simplicity in the bill in what is an extraordinarily complicated environment is, is what will make this bill successful. I think, and I keep coming back to this, this, this tension for me between making a decision, a positive decision, I will be on the register or I won't be on the register, is, is delivering a decision. Um, the deemed authorisation may not be a decision having been made. And I'm looking at this, I'm, I keep, when, when we have these conversations, I always try to put myself, as inevitably you put yourself in that situation. Do you not think that that, that creates a, a, almost a two-tier system in, in terms of of potential organ donation there and, and puts the, the family in that in a dilemma? So, um, when you opt in, your wishes are known. It's very easy as a healthcare professional to start that conversation with a family. Like I've said, Johnny was on the organ donor register. He's expressed, you know, a decision to donate his organs. I'd really like for us to work together to make that happen. We'll give you information, etc. Where they have opted out, equally, we need to have a conversation to ensure that they haven't changed their mind. So that would be something like, you know, in 10 years' time, you know, in 2017, Johnny opted out of the organ donor register, but we want to have a conversation to make sure that that remained his decision and that we, if he had changed that decision, that would be helpful. In the situation, I think, where we have unknown wishes in a, in, and where deemed would come into play, um, I think a lot of families err on the side of caution in those situations and therefore the default position is to say no to donation, whereby unless you opt out, it will be assumed that you're supportive of donation. And I think that how we get that clarity of message across to the public absolutely um, is key. I know the French have run some very simply worded campaigns um, I can get pictures of them and, and, and provide them, um, which have helped the French get that message across um, to the public. I don't think as a healthcare professional involved in approaching families, it complicates for us. Mm -hmm. I think having people who are registered actually makes the conversation easier. And in a way, having people who might be deemed also allows us to be a little bit more culturally presumptive because they haven't made that decision to opt out. So Johnny hasn't opted out of the organ donor register and therefore has indicated his support. Now, the family may well object at that point, um, but it allows us to start the conversation with something tangible 
And as you know from our previous conversations, we will always check the organ donor register prior to going in um, to speak to a family. And if necessary, we provide them with a copy of that organ donation register entry so that they can see it for themselves. Good. Again, looking at it from my, my perspective, if I, was, if I was in that horrible situation, um, and having heard, we, most of us, we, 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 we talked, we, certainly before uh, I got involved in this, this, uh, this particular uh, investigation, organ donation is liver, heart, you know, uh, kidneys. Now we're struggling a wee bit, okay, we'll, we'll go, go on for, you know, yes, we've got lungs, and, but we go on and on, and it, we, we just talk to on tissue, face, hands. Now, to, f to my mind, I would like... To, to, to suggest that it would be much better if that conversation had been uh, had been had with the donor, or the donor had had that uh, that 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 ability to tick the boxes that they need to tick, because that is that is a conversation that how could you you know, you know obviously, but that's what, trying have, passing that conversation on to the relatives. So my, I think I think my my question really is: should we not be really looking at ways in which, because I'm one of the 40, as I said earlier on, disgraceful. Um, but if you, put, if you put the form in front of me, I tick the box. Should we not be looking at ways in which we allow that, that, that positive uh, decision to be made easier for everybody, looking at those, those uh, instigations where we can increase the number of people who say yes or who make the decision to say no? Should that not be put into legislation? Firstly, not. So, for some of the much more rare types of transplant, facial composite tissue, limbs, for example, we would have to approach the family separately for those anyway, because it comes down to things like skin matching, and there's a whole raft of other um, assessments that we need to make in those situations. I think the organs that are for want of a better word, commonly transplanted, the ones that people sign on the organ donor register for are the ones that people absolutely recognise. And therefore, those are the ones that it should be possible to be deemed for. And that the other much more rare, you know, where we have a uterine uh, transplantation programme in London at the moment. And internationally, also, you will hear in the press of other types of quite unusual um, transplants, particularly for those individuals who um, have been at war and, and things. So <clears throat> I really don't have a problem. Um, and, and I do think that the, the public generally, I mean, we spend up to three hours with a family, you know, as, as you know, and therefore some of that explanation really can only come with the understanding of talking with a healthcare professional that really knows what's likely to happen and what's likely to be considered in an individual situation. We don't want to burden families with a whole pile of information only to discover they can't donate X, Y, Z, A, B and C anyway. We try to tailor our conversations with them um, so that um, they absolutely know what what we are thinking at an early stage. I know future proofing is something Mark's interested in particularly. Um, so I'll defer to Mark. 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 Uh, thank you, Camille. I, I think we would all agree with the principle that it's better to ask the donor yeah. whilst he or she is still alive yeah. than ask uh, relatives after after their death. Um, and I think we would we would probably all support the principle of trying to encourage people to have that conversation and to make to make an informed decision. But but even with those efforts, of course, one one can't force people to make a decision one way or another. Some people might just never get round to it. Some people might actually not really want to make a decision because it's too unpleasant a thing to think about, our own, our own mortality uh, sometimes. Um, you said you haven't made a decision on organ donation yourself. Actually, I have. I've opted in. But there are many of the other things that come through my letterbox and email which I am just too busy to deal with and think, well, I might deal with it some other time. And of course, of course I never do. So I, th so I think, for me, it's not an either or. I think yes, we sh absolutely should try and encourage people to to make that decision one way or the other. Um, but having the deemed authorization as well covers that gap, as it were, of of those other individuals in the way that Leslie has described. 
Stephen Cole. I think, I think your point's very well made. Um, there, the easiest thing for us when we go in to have a conversation with a family is if their wishes are known, one way or the other. Um, they're not then put in a position of trying to come up with a decision at a point in time when they're exhausted and grieving and haven't slept for uh, two or three days. At the same time, signing up to the organ donor register, as currently happens, is an expression of a wish at a point in time. It's not informed consent. It's not the same as you saying, I'll have a hip replacement and these are the things that will happen. It's often not the full picture of information which the patient needs to make a decision in an informed way. And throughout the UK, we've made a decision that that, that is the process that we will go through. We won't have a, a formal informed consent um, situation in terms of signing up to the organ donor register. So I think the new legislation as proposed may take away some of that difficulty in that if you have not opted out, then you haven't made a positive decision not to go uh, become an organ donor, then it will be assumed to be deemed and we can start the conversation from there. One of the real strengths of the 2006 Act was that it afforded healthcare professionals the opportunity um, to work with families and provide the information at the level the family wanted. We do have families, for example, who say absolutely supportive of donation. He was on the organ donor register. Do whatever you need to do. I don't really want to know anything. I'll answer your questions, but I don't want to know anything. And we also get families who want to discuss donation in minute detail. And the Act allows us to do that, to provide information. And that's one of the strengths, I think, of authorisation versus consent, where that is implied and the word informed comes informed consent. And I think that's really important to try to retain that, um, because that, that has allowed families under some circumstances, for example, to go home and we follow up with them and take telephone authorisation, as do our tissue service colleagues. So we actually work with the families to find the best solution for them. Nothing in the bill as it's drafted, I, yeah. I would assume that would take away that ability. Yeah. Would that be your interpretation? Yeah, hopefully. Also? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you. I, um, I'd like to ask um, just issues around adults with incapacity because we haven't really covered that um, this morning. And uh, in our submissions, it's interesting to, to describe how the provision stating that an adult is incapa incapable of understanding the nature and consequences of deemed consent is therefore not deemed to have consented. But there's various issues around um, incapacity, whether it's uh, a new issue or if it's something that's been prolonged or, or developed over a period of time. So I'm interested in your thoughts of whether there is enough information in the legislation that that uh, that allows uh, incapacity to be considered uh, and and so that people that don't have capacity uh, are supported in this legislation Stephen Cole thank you um, so I, I work with the patients who are in intensive care who are critically ill 95% um, of those patients lack capacity at the time in intensive care so we would sign a so this is short-term lack of capacity rather than I think what you were mentioning which is maybe a more long-term lack of capacity um, so there are two sorts of deceased organ donation as, I, as I'm sure you'll be aware those following circulatory death um, and those following brainstem death for the patients who die following circulatory death they remain patients until the point of their death so the legislation that's pertinent to them is the adults with incapacity act for those patients who are brainstem dead, they become uh, dead at the completion of the first set of brainstem tests, and so the legislation that pertains to them is the Human Tissue Act, which is which is much more favourable in terms of um, things like the death procedures and things that you mentioned earlier. So, in terms of in terms of the AWI for for ICU patients, I think the bill is is as it's written is fine. I, I can't really comment, it's not my area of expertise, on the chronic incapacitated patient, long-term, who has long-term incapacity that predates their admission to intensive care. Is Leslie Logan anything to add? In? Only to say, I guess, over the years, we, we have come across um, families, and we always 
as you know, adhere to the hierarchy of families nearest relatives that we approach about organ donation. And we, we do come across relatives who are incapacitated for various reasons. You know, sometimes it may be as simple as the fact that they have consumed alcohol or drugs. Sometimes it may be that they have something, for example, such as Down syndrome, which limits their understanding um, of, the, of the process. Sometimes we have families occasionally who are so incapacitated by grief that they, they simply can't even respond to us. And, you know, in all of those circumstances, we work very sensitively with our intensive care colleagues. And if we're not comfortable that the family understand um, the process of authorisation, then we would make a decision not to consider that. Where somebody's on the organ donor register, however, we already have authorisation to proceed. And there is something around sharing knowledge. That doesn't happen very often, you know, in truth. But it, if, if that's sort of the question you're asking about taking authorisation also from, from individuals that don't have capacity, it's relevant. Yeah, okay. 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 Thanks. Thanks, Camino. I just wanted to um, raise a small point because it was raised with us um, from the panel this morning in terms of complex families and changing relationships and sometimes um, next of kin not being clear. And I just wondered... Um, in terms of that, what your experience has been, and in fact, in some cases, I think we heard this morning where the decisions are then divided, um, especially between maybe um, a partner and a parent of the individual. Yeah. Um, we approach the nearest relative as opposed to the next of kin. Sometimes there's a slight difference in who that may be. Um, and yes, occasionally we will find ourselves approaching a partner um, or who has been a partner for more than six months where there is still a parent in, in a teenager, for example. Generally speaking, the amount of time that we spend with families, we come to a consensus and we're, we're reasonably skilled at doing that. Um, if we have family discord, generally speaking, that is more likely to be, in our experience, um, two adults with a child and the, the, the adults, for whatever reason, are separated and a father might say yes and a mother might say no. Um, and again, it's about the decision of the individual if they've expressed a decision is, is, is our starting point. But equally, in those circumstances, we have we give time and space and, you know, we're there to do that. That's our job to spend however long it takes to help that family reach that decision. But it may be that in those circumstances to try to help everyone um, that we go for a limited donation and we may well consider abdominal organs but not cardiothoracic organs. Um, and that allows both, both parents, if you like, to feel that they have had some input and control of the situation. Um, in some circumstances, donation isn't possible um, if we have you know, a, a real strength of, of feeling. And, you know, I, I really... I, you know, the, the, the newspaper test of they stole my son's organs, wheeling him down the corridor would not be something. I think that to the greater transplant programme that would provide detriment. Um, so we wouldn't want to, to, to be in that situation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Stephen Calder, do you want to? I would echo most of that. I think the most important thing in that conversation is time. Um, and and time for families to come to an understanding about about what what should happen it's often easier if we have an understanding of what the individual patient's wishes were um, the more difficult situations is where a patient had not signed the organ donor register when they were well and so the family didn't didn't have any understanding but but generally with time and with with uh, skilled communication that we can we can work through this a, a sort of usual scenario in, in, to explain that is that a father might arrive at the hospital because he works locally and he accepts death or dying much quicker than the mother who's some distance away and she arrives several hours later. So people accept things at different rates and we have to wait for people to catch up and then move forward together, I think. It's key. Thank you very much. Very beautiful. In, in terms of um, research and clinical research, that was also raised with us that some families thought that that would be automatically taking place. Um, and in terms of that, you know, I'm thinking of the Scottish um, Brain Bank, things like that for dementia, you know, individuals, not necessarily organ donation. Is, is that an area as well which this potentially um, 
could be improved? I know they're very separate issues, but... We take authorisation and do the, the social history questionnaire that you've seen um, for other purposes also, for research, training, education and audit, and, and Mark yeah, will, will talk about quality assurance as a, a welcome uh, change to, to this legislation. And so we, we do that so that families don't have to answer those questions twice by a different set of, uh, of healthcare professionals. And when we hold our remembrance services, for example, we do acknowledge those individuals. Sometimes patients go to theatre um, for organ recovery and the organs are not suitable, but the organs can then be sent for research if we have that permission. And actually, families, we, we write really nice letters back to families about furthering medical education. Um, and they're really very pleased to, to receive those letters and they also are included in receiving the, the medal on behalf of the Queen, uh, etc. So. Mark Turner, did you want to add? Yeah. Um, yes, so uh, apart from obviously uh, the organs and tissues are taken primarily for clinical reasons, but there are clearly some that are taken and they're not suitable for one reason or another, perhaps microbiological contamination, for example. Um, and that is very important for us that we are able to use some of those um, tissues or organs for uh, what we call process developments um, because a lot of the tissues undergo quite complex manufacturing steps and they require uh, validation and quality control in exactly the same way as you'd expect for um, say a, a pharmaceutical that, that to, to give you a conceptualization um, so we're, we're very pleased to see in this bill uh, quality assurance written in because actually we can't transact our jobs properly under the human tissue quality and safety regulations without without applying those kind of quality assurance. Um, I think, um, as Leslie has said, um, while the principal consent is for uh, clinical use, uh, research use uh, and um, evaluation is, is also written in, and obviously people can uh, assent to that or, or, or not, as the case may be. I think that's... That is a very different scenario from from where one is taking, asking to take tissues for research purposes only. I think that's a completely different scenario, and I, I wouldn't want to conflate those because in that scenario, uh, independent ethics will be taken. There will be an independent consenting process. So, um, I wouldn't want to conf conflate those two uh, situations. Yep, thank you very much, Sandra Hart. Thank you very much, convener, and, and uh, good afternoon. Now I think it is actually. <clears throat> I want to explore again, similar to what I'd asked the previous panel about the pre-death procedures, and uh, Dr Cole, you had actually mentioned that, working in invested, you know, intensive care as well. Uh, some people have, you know, visit concerns in regards to how the procedure, uh, you know, is, is carried out, and new to me, I, you know, I didn't realise that if you opt into organ donation, I've never seen any information about it, that this is part and parcel of organ donation. So that was a, a new one to me and uh, I would think you would probably agree that people should be told about that. But, you know, do you share the concerns that witnesses we've heard, you know, and regret around pre-death procedures? How is it carried out just now? Um, basically, and should it be carried out under deemed consent or should it always be um, express consent? So that's kind of three questions. This could be quite a long answer. So I'll try and, try and make it as short <laughs> as, I, as I can. So, so as you heard from the previous, uh, for the previous panel, um, <coughs> there are a number of things that we do day in, day out for patients, some of which um, are quite invasive. For example, putting central lines into a patient, re-intubating a patient, um, giving, giving drugs, quite strong medications to bring blood pressure up, et cetera, et cetera, taking blood, that sort of thing. What... What generally happens in terms of the current at the moment is that if a family agree to organ donation, the worst thing that can possibly happen to that patient is that the organs are not able to be utilised because the patient is not physiologically optimised in order to allow a successful organ donation retrieval to take place. Um, in the planned legislation, we've had a lot of discussion with colleagues in the Scottish Government about these interventions, and as you say, pre-death procedures. It's not a great, not a great term, but but um, it's is where we are. And and we've we've tried to stratify them into two, um, into those which are routine, uh, are painless, and have next to no chance of causing harm, versus those which are less common, perhaps more invasive, and have a 
um, a, a bigger, greater chance of potentially causing harm. And an example of that might be, for example, doing a bronchoscopy. So you put a telescope into the patient's lungs and you would, under direct vision, um, hoover out any secretions, any contamination within the, within the patient's lungs. That's quite invasive. If you were awake, that would be quite uncomfortable. Um, but it's, it's some, something which we do routinely to benefit patients who are on uh, ventilation. So, so I think in terms of these procedures, um, it's right and proper to stratify them according to risk, as in patient risk. Um, because remember, these, these population of people are patients. They're not donors. They remain patients until they, become, until they die, and then they become potential donors. So I think the, the, the uh, without without talking forever, the, the 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 level that we have at the moment in the proposed bill is is about right. We, it's something we thought long and hard about. Thank you very much. Okay, so families who say yes to donation are pretty after that point are pretty committed. Um, they want something good to come out of the, strat the the tragedy, and they really want to save other people's lives. Um, we are very careful to explain to families what tests um, or pre-death procedures need done to allow that to happen. We already provide families with the information of any tests that are done. So blood tests taken to um, support the matching of organs with recipients, urine tests taken to test for any infection or any kidney, obvious kidney damage. Um, secretions from the chest to check for infection and so any test that we all that we would do we already explain and um, what i guess i would be concerned about is having to ask families more questions you know in a sort of a tick box manner and um, rather than having a conversation with a family which is as I've explained, in order for donation now to proceed, we need to do a number of tests. These tests you know, won't harm your, your loved one at any time um, and they're not painful. Um, you know, and we'll, we'll be doing them to do things like ensure best matching of organs, etc. Et so um, that, that really is my, my thought on that. OK, thank, thank you very much. Just... Um, one question on that particular one, and I want to ask about the forms that they fill in, which will be a, a short one on that particular one. I, th I think, anyway, uh, in regards to the Law Society, they have raised some concerns about medical ethics. Uh, are you quite content that the bill covers yourselves in, in regards to medical ethics? Uh, you know, in the pre... Uh, I think we should change the wording rather than pre-death, but you know, in, in regards to that, as it's known at the moment... You know, from the Scottish intensive care perspective, um, we've been closely involved with um, with putting the bill and the, the detail of the bill. Um, I think we feel reassured um, by the way the bill has been worded. Um, I think that, that what we were trying to do is, that, as you alluded to in the last session, medical development takes place at a fantastic pace. Things that are not even thought about today may become commonplace next year. Um, and so it was trying in many ways not, not to be too prescriptive about the list, but talk, if possible, in generalities of types of test. Um, because if we if we miss out test Y and it becomes commonplace next year, then then we'll end up in a situation where we have to go back and ask specifically about that. And a, an example of that is um, in the past we specifically um, excluded the use of heparin. Um, in the potential donor um, because we were concerned that there was a small possibility that heparin could cause harm in terms of uh, bleeds within to the brain. Um, our surgical colleagues regret that that took place and feel that heparin is very important in optimising um, the potential organ uh, for transplant. And so, so it was that sort of example which, which we were keen to try and, uh, to try and avoid. Well, you're quite content uh, in regards to that, even the Law Society, you yeah. know, has raised it, so you're quite content in, in that respect. Yeah. Just this, it's not a small one, obviously, because it's been raised many, many a time, and I know Leslie, we spoke to yourself in regards to that. Uh, obviously, the bureaucracy around the 350 questions that people have to fill in, and we heard this morning again from the panel we were speaking to that... Uh, so they felt some of the questions were very invasive, they were embarrassing, 
and won't get into the details of the ones that they felt were very embarrassing, particularly if they've got their kids around them as well. <coughs> and um, we just wondered, can, um, is there any other way we can shorten these questions or different types of things to put into the bill in regards to people don't need to you know, answer these questions? It's a very emotional time for them and they're not ready sometimes. So the questions are absolutely necessary because our job is to ensure that transplantation is safe, first and foremost, um, for the recipients. What I do think, and you know, Mark's maybe better placed to talk about s some of this than I am, is that we certainly know that some of the questions that we ask, we're asking specifically for tissue donation. And it may be that in the future we're able to develop you know, a subset of those questions if we can identify early on in the process that the patient will never become a tissue donor. What we don't want to do is not ask the questions and then find out we have a potential tissue donor. So th there is a way of, of doing that. And I, I have provided um, to our government colleagues, so I think that they will come to you in turn, some examples of questionnaires from Australia and the USA. And I know that my own medical um, my own medical director, Professor Forsyth, has, has done similar from some of the European. And you will see they're pretty much all the same. Um, I think that the issue of the authorisation form is a slightly different matter. And I think we would work very hard to try to um, reduce any of the questions that are in that. And we do that by asking the healthcare questions first, so that we know ourselves professionally that we can exclude, for example, if we know somebody's had a heart attack, we're not going to approach about heart donation. If we know someone's a diabetic, we're not going to approach about pancreas donation. And we will make those exclusions on the authorisation form to try to contract the process. And the questions generally are very, very similar, um, if not almost identical to those that are asked around a blood donation. Yes, um, yes I, I agree with you. We they are a very extensive set of questions. Whether the 350, I'm not sure. I'll take, I'll take your word for that. <laughs> uh, some of them, I would say, are nested questions. So you might ask preliminary questions such as, have you been overseas recently? Oh, has, your, has your relative been overseas? And then if they answer no, you move on from that. And if they answer yes, you go into a more detailed question. Um, they are more stringent for tissues than they are for organs because sometimes the risk benefit is slightly different in those two kinds of scenarios. Um, they are they are very consistent uh, with the questions we ask of blood donors. They're obviously phrased and framed in a slightly different way. Um, they also tend to be very consistent both across the UK and across Europe, and that's because of the regulatory framework that we work within. So they're guided by, for example, the Human Tissue Quality and Safety Regulations from 2007, which is UK-wide, and is itself a transposition of the EU Tissues and Cells Directives. Um, and, and the... The granularity around those is put in at a UK level by UK Blood Services Joint Professional Advisory Committee. So um, things change um, in, in questions. Um, to try and give you examples, we, we have complex geographic exclusions because things like um, malaria and West Nile virus and chikungunya fever change their distributions in the world. Um, so these are so it's, it is a very complex set of questions. But I, I would come back to what Leslie said that. They are evidential based and they're there to try and secure the, act, the safety of the product that is going back to the patient ultimately. So, so that's what's driving the complexity. 350 questions. Chair, there was a. I was going to say the flip side to that question. I, I would just make a plea that with the new legislation, we can shorten the process as much as possible. The process already takes a very long time, which is exhausting for, for relatives. But also, we heard in the last session about questions about intensive care capacity. Intensive care is a very scarce resource uh, within Scotland, and so occupying a bed for an additional 12 or 15 hours may in some circumstances mean that somebody else who needs an intensive care bed is not able to access one locally. Very briefly, Sandra. It was just um, the flip side of the coin. Is there anything in the bill of bureaucracy that would make it worse, basically? Do you see anything that would you know, drag it out even more that's contained in the bill? Um, my understanding of the duty to inquire um, changes are that we would not be expected to 
go to the ends of the earth and be phoning relatives in Australia and you know whatever. Um, that it could be. Conf we we generally do always have the nearest relatives in the room or close by, um, to consider um, their. You know, if, if anyone has additional knowledge, and that is a question we ask in the medical social history questionnaire. Also, is there anyone else we should be consulting or speaking to about their decisions? So I think that that's probably okay. I wouldn't like to think that the um, the additional questions about pre-death procedures lengthen that, because as you saw from our sort of armchair theatre, the families really want to get back to the bedside. You know, um, and that's absolutely rightly where they should be, and we're very mindful of that. Um, so, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Alec Cole-Hamilton. Presiding officer, and good morning to the panel. Thanks again for your, um, your input, in particular, Leslie Logan. I think we were all very struck when you and your colleagues came for an informal evidence session, so thank you again for that. Um, we talk about these being difficult decisions and difficult uh, discussions to have with people enduring, as you said, the worst days of their lives. So there is an immense degree of pressure on their mental health around all the decisions they have to make at that very short window of time. Um, we also heard from transplant recipients um, this morning, which suggested that uh, that they have they also experience a roller coaster of waiting and and having false dawns of getting the phone call, jumping in an ambulance, and then being turned around. And, and what strikes me is that we have no real longitudinal mental health specialist support for either group of people, either the recipients in the long wait before they get a, an organ and in the convalescence after, or the family group members who make that difficult decision. Obviously, they uh, don't need necessarily support until the very end because they, in many cases they don't know it's going to happen, but they need support around that decision and then in the weeks and months to follow. Do you think there's a gap? And is this bill an opportunity for us to close that gap? a gap um, on both both sides. Firstly, for the recipient side, I did used to manage um, a transplant programme in Edinburgh and I know that the social workers and the, the um, recipient coordinators do follow up with patients of course who are called in for transplantation but then stood down because the organs are, are not available. I think that a discussion around the resource for that probably is very timely especially if we're hoping to increase further the number of transplants. Interestingly, for donor families, um, earlier on this year, um, well, a couple of years ago, I spent some time in Sydney with the Australian um, Transplant and Dona Donation Service. And earlier on this year, um, I was at a donor in, in Scotland and we had waited some 24 hours for the son to come from Australia um, to be at his mother's bedside. He agreed to donation, donation proceeded. And I used my contacts in Australia to ensure that he's invited to a remembrance service in Australia. And the conversation, or the electronic conversation that I had with my equivalent in the Brisbane area was that she would also invite him to participate in what all Australian families are offered, which is up to two sessions with a psychologist or a bereavement counsellor to support them in the decision that they made through organ donation if there was anything that they wanted to pursue. So that was something that um, I knew existed, um, but I've never had a family had that offer we direct them to organizations such as crews um, and you know we we do follow our families up ourselves we write to them within two weeks of the donation and um, to give them some information about the um about the recipients we invite them to the annual service as you as you know and then on an annual basis we can provide updates but we don't do anything specifically for those individuals um who who have whose loved ones have donated, who might um, require ongoing psychological support, unlike some other countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen Cole, did you want to? No, really no, anything no, other no. than to, okay. uh, just to uh, echo that. Echo that. Excellent. David Stewart. Thank you, uh, convener. What assessment have you made as panel members of the Spanish system of organ transplantation? I was in Munich last week at the International um, Donation and Transplant Society meeting and I was beefing up a little bit on Spain. So, 
First of all, I would say we need to be careful that we're measuring apples with apples. Um, our definition in the UK of a donor is someone who goes to theatre, who has an organ removed for the purposes of transplantation. In Spain, their definition of a donor is somebody who goes to theatre for donation. So we're not absolutely measuring this, the same thing. Um, in Spain, they have a system where they reapproach families up to six times for the family to say yes. We might feel that's a little bit um, harassing. So if a family say no, they'll wait half an hour and they'll go back in. If the family still say no, they'll wait half an hour and they'll go back in again. And this is well understood um, in, in intensive care, so their rates are high. There are also some cultural influences in Spain. Um, you know, the, the Catholic Church supports organ donation and they have quite extended families. And so there are some um, demographic reasons and uh, cultural and religious reasons why donation might be better supported um, there. Stephen has spoken and you know, may speak again, I guess, about the intensive care bed numbers. But what's really interesting is that the slightly, and I don't think anyone knows this yet really, but the slightest, latest surge in donation rates in Spain are because of a new initiative which they're calling intensive care for organ donation. And that is um, that they are now approaching families of individuals in hospital wards who are not ventilated and um, asking them whether following the individuals, for example, a stroke, it's a catastrophic, and entering a, a pathway of care where they're likely to die, whether donation may be possible, and then electively ventilating the individuals. And that, that does have significant ethical you know, concern. So I think, you know, Spain also, their, their donation after circulatory death donation is a different type of circulatory death donation that we pursue in the United Kingdom. Um, so they have got um, the ability to retrieve organs in every one of their hospitals, whereas the UK model is that our retrieval teams are very highly specialist doctors that work in, you know, and so we have seven liver and abdominal retrieval teams and six cardiothoracic teams that service the UK. Um, so the, the model of healthcare is is also very different and, and, and all of those things together um, contribute to, you know, as you see, quite different numbers. Croatia also is a, is a very high donating country, but that only has, I think, nine hospitals within its country. And actually, it's much easier to manage nine hospitals and move everyone in the same direction, you know, compared to Scotland that has 25 and, you know, 12 different health boards, 13 different health boards. So there are real differences and we watch all the time to see if there's anything that we can that we can consider. I think that's very useful. You'd, uh, all three of you would have heard my question to the last panel. And I think, uh, personally, I've always been very wary of comparing different countries, even within the EU. Uh, having said that, the, the very crude rates, as you'd have heard me say at the last session, is that the UK donation rate is half of Spain's, even assuming the same family uh, refusal rate. That That's still quite striking. So, so I suppose my point is, notwithstanding some of these cultural differences, is there best practice that we can pick up that may or may not appear in this bill? Well, firstly, the other thing that I should have said is that the discard rate of our organs in Spain is very high. So they are approaching and getting permission for donation from patients that we might not have considered in the UK as suitable. And the result of that is that the organs are discarded and not transplanted. Um, and that actually is very important to us that if we pursue donation we're pursuing it for the you know with an outcome that's expected we don't ever remove organs unless we know that they've been placed and accepted by a transplant center for a named patient so that, that's another f factor um i'm sorry i've forgotten what you actually asked me the second yeah. time I heard your, your comments to the previous panel as well, and, and as well as um, public awareness and education, I would, I would like to highlight the fact that Scotland has a lower number of intensive care beds per thousand population than the rest of the UK, but massively lower than southern Europe and the United States. And that's a, that's a cultural situation that we have um, developed within, within the UK and Scotland. In, intensive care is a very scarce resource. Um, and my other hat is uh, 
being a role in SIGSAG, which is the intensive care audit group. So I know about the numbers of patients admitted to, vari to various hospitals. And I, and I think one of the ways that we could affect change would be to invest more in intensive care capacity around the country. Um, because although donation would be a byproduct of that, it would also benefit the wider population in terms of life saved and returning to, um, uh, to normal health as well. The other thing that's worthy of note is that the further south in Europe you go, yeah. the higher the number of road traffic accidents that cause trauma. Only 3% of our donors in Scotland come to us through road traffic accident and trauma because actually our roads are you know, safe in comparison to certainly southern Europe. That's a very useful point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Finally, David Torrance. Thank you, conveners, and good afternoon, panel. Um, do you agree that with 16 being aged or deemed uh, authorisation in Scotland? Any views? Mark Turner. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I don't think it's for SMBs yes, to take a view on such a, a, a position on such a question. I think that's a that's a, an issue for um, for the people of Scotland and and for for Parliament. Um, Whatever it is, it is the desire to be the right cut off. Then, obviously, we would we will respect that um, and apply apply the appropriate uh, regulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh. There's no no, no different oh. view from other witnesses. David, thank you, convener. Um, with different ages for deemed authorisation across the UK, could this cause any legal problems for transplants? I'm not aware of any at the minute. We would still accept an organ in Scotland from a child that dies in Wales and, and certainly the allocation of, of organs has not been problematic in the past um, in, in those circumstances. I might actually be able to answer this question for you uh, by, uh, by analogy and that is um, when we changed the regulations uh, around deferral of men who've had sex for men for blood donation uh, England, Wales and Scotland changed to a 12-month and now a 3-month deferral and our uh, Northern Ireland did not change. It remained with a, um, a permanent deferral at least for a period of time. Um, so we, we obviously had to come to an understanding with them because sometimes in times of shortage we support them by providing blood for example um, and they agreed that they would receive blood from us from either NHSBT or from SNBTS which obviously was um, uh, selected and screened according to our donor selection and, and testing criteria, not necessarily theirs. And, and so I think in the scenario, which I think you're suggesting where there might be a difference in the age between, say, Scotland and, and England, um, both countries would have to accept the application of the of criteria in the relevant jurisdiction. But a relatively straightforward matter in your view. Excellent. Thank you very much uh, to our witnesses once again. It's been another very useful session. We will now briefly suspend while the panel leave and we will then go into private session. Thank you very much.